repeated. Take your Bible, if you would, this morning and turn to Luke chapter 8. You've heard the expression, what in the world is happening? Probably many times in your life. What is happening in the world? If you were to ask many people that, you'd probably get many different answers. You'd hear something about the political maneuvering, social structuring, organized crime with many different costumes. But I want to ask this from God's perspective. What in the world is happening? What is happening? When God looks down on this planet, He knows all about the political maneuvering. He knows all about the social structuring. He knows all about the organized crime in many different costumes. But what is God looking at on this planet? What is really happening as far as God is concerned? Well, in Luke chapter 8, He gives us, in a nutshell, what is happening. <coughs> And we're going to read this. Everyone is in this parable somewhere. You are in this parable. This is what in the world is happening. This is it right here. Okay? And according to God and His viewpoint, this is the most important thing that is happening in our world. Your story is in this story. When it is all over, you will have been in one of these categories or several of them. But this is what is happening. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. Now this is God speaking to his creation. We should all sit up and listen because this is the Almighty, the Creator, the one who you're going to face on Judgment Day. He's telling you something on your level. Something you can get. He can speak it in words to, so beyond you, but he's speaking it very simple and clear, hoping that you will get it. If you don't get it, then you will reap the consequences of not getting something that you could get if you wanted to. Okay? So listen up. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. <coughs> he spake a parable. Verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried. God is crying. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? That means I've just said something incredibly profound that affects you intricately. You need to go study it. Amen. You need to ponder it. You need to meditate on it. You need to find out how it affects you. And that was his last word to the people. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you have concern, if you have an ear to hear, you need to think seriously about what I just said and find out what it means. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this prayer will be? Well, they had ears to hear. They wanted to know. What does this mean? How does this affect me? And he said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. The reason he says that is because those who were not his disciples had chosen to not be his disciples. Okay? If you look in the book of Matthew, he says, to him that hath, to him shall be given more. Okay, those who don't, those who've kept on the outside and, and, you know, they're skeptics and they're sitting back. They want to watch, they want to listen, but they don't want to get in. They're not going to find out what they need to find out. They have eyes, but they really don't want to see. They have ears, but they really don't want to hear. They don't look for something to criticize. <clears throat> but to others in parables, it's seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Understand the seed is the same for everyone. The seed is the word of God. <clears throat> Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Okay? Now, those on the wayside are the lost. The question is, 
Will the seed <coughs> take root? That's the big question there. Will the seed take root? The seed is the same for all. 1 Peter 1, 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed is never the problem. The seed is never at fault. The soil is you. The soil is the condition of your heart toward God. Not just the condition of your heart. It's the condition of your heart toward God. You know why I say that? It's because there are other seeds that are sown that take root just fine. Mm -hmm. There are other seeds that are sown that find fertile soil. Mm -hmm. You are fertile to the, towards that that you want to be fertile towards. Right. And you are hard pan towards that which you do not want to be fertile towards. Okay? There are plenty of seeds that take root in all the ground, all the people. But they choose what seeds take root and what seeds do not take root. The question here is, will the seed of the Word of God take root? There are plenty of other things taking root. And turn to Matthew chapter 13. The parable of the sower is given in slightly different words. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 12. <laughs> For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Now I want you to understand what understand means. Okay? In this parable, he said, neither do they understand. Now, is that inability or choice? Okay, he says here, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye he shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So, the idea that they don't understand is not in this context inability. In this context, not understanding is not applying the mind to understand. In this context, not understanding means shutting the eyes, mm -hmm. shutting the ears. The heart is, is sluggish. The heart is thick. The heart is not open to truth. It's not soft, okay? And that's what the word wax gross means. It has become sluggish. So, we have the lost, the wayside. You're not in God's camp. You're not in with God's people, you are on the wayside. Will the word take root? Will they make room for the seed to sink in, or will they be hardened toward the seed? Now, verse 16 of Matthew 13, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. That's why they got the interpretation and the others did not. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Many prophets and righteous men, they've had their ears open, their hearts open. They would have loved to have heard what Jesus was saying. They would have thrilled to see and hear what the Messiah said, but they didn't have the Messiah, but they did hear and see what they did have. Mm -hmm. And God is saying here, you don't realize how many men would wish they could be here listening to what I'm saying. But they didn't get that opportunity. But they did follow the opportunity they had. That's why they were prophets and righteous. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. Now remember why they didn't understand it. Okay? Keep that in, your con in the context. Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Because they did not grab it, because they did not embrace it, because they gave no room for it to sink in and take root, the devil snatched it away. 
Well, naturally, he's sowing his own seeds, right? He doesn't want what he would consider weeds in his garden. And he considers the truth to be an obnoxious weed. Or a noxious weed, I should say. Um, this is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he which heareth the word, and ain't on with joy receives it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is either heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it in context, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some in hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. Now back to Luke 8. So we have, we have the first group, the lost. Will the seed take root? Will they open their hearts to the truth of God? You know, as a youth, I was raised in church. I was in the nursery. I was in toddlers one, toddlers two. I was in the intermediates. I was in the youth department. I was raised in church. I had uncles who were preachers. As I entered high school, I had heard so much of that. It was like they say, water off a duck's back. I heard preaching all the time. I heard the sermons. I sang the hymns. But it had no effect on me. Somehow I had closed my ears. Somehow I had closed my eyes. For some reason, even though if you ask me, I believed in God, I believed the Bible, I believed I was going to heaven. I've been vaccinated real well because I prayed the prayer and I got wet in the baptistry and they told me I was going to heaven and couldn't lose it. So that was all taken care of. That was all sewed up and done. And now... I was looking to see what else life had to offer me. And I was interested in rodeo. And I was interested in, you know, uh, hiking and hunting. I was interested in all the things that attract young people. I wanted to be tough and cool. And I wanted uh, the girls to think so. And, and all, all that sort of thing. I was lost. I was lost. Partly because of bad doctrine. Bad doctrine that made me think I was saved when I was lost. Bad doctrine that I did not realize the necessity of the word taking root and bearing fruit. I thought that Jesus took care of all that on the cross, the finished work of Christ. Of course, I trusted in that. I believed that his blood would save me. And so therefore, according to Baptist doctrine, which is heresy and error, I thought I was fine. I'm thankful that there was a time when the Spirit of God, I believe partly due to my mother's prayers, the prayers of my youth pastor who could see that all of his sermons weren't making a dent, there was people praying for me. And one night, as I listened, my ears began to hear. My eyes began to see. My heart was opened up realizing that I was on a crash course with God's judgment. He was not happy with me. I was not living for him. And I broke my heart. That hard soil received the seed and it sprouted. Well, then we move to the next group. We move to the baby Christian, the newborn. Now the question there is, will the roots go deep soon enough? <clears throat> because, okay, it's stony ground. That means there are hard places. There's a hard pan. There is something still in the soil. There's enough soil for that seed to come in. It had enough room to sprout. But there are things there that must be dealt with or there will be a short lifespan <coughs> to that Christian life. He said, uh, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root. Well, now, they, a, a new sprout doesn't have much root, right? 
Well, for a while they believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. In Matthew it said, when tribulation or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. So the question is, this is untilled, uncultivated soil, naturally shallow, and typically a person at this stage will take root and show some growth, maybe two to five years. They have no depth. It's a shallow faith. It's a shallow Christianity. They will be active in growth. And then if they don't get root, they will plateau. Luke 13, 7. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? So God will give the new sprout some time. Is it going to bear fruit? What happens when the sun comes up? What happens when the sun gets hot? Oh yeah, the word takes root, but then what? Why? Why am I following God's word? Is God a means to an end? Is there 75% surrender and 25% unbroken? You're still in church. John 15 talks about the branch that doesn't bear fruit. It's cut off and withered, cast away. It doesn't mean it's cast away from church. It doesn't mean it's cast away from religion. It doesn't mean it's cast away for, from profession. It means it's cast away from a life connection with God. Right. Okay? There's a lot of people sitting in church that sprouted and began to grow. And then they withered and plateaued and they're not growing. They haven't grown for 20 years. They haven't grown for 10 years. They're going nowhere spiritually. But they're still in church. They still have a profession. But there's no living link between them and God. The life of God is not flowing through them. They are not being conformed to the image of God's Son. Actually, they're working to conform God to their ideas and their image. They're still in church. It's the idolatry of ism. They have found something, an ideology, that's okay for them. They're comfortable with it, and so that's where they stop growing. They plateau right there. This is what I believe. This is what I want to be. And they go no further. And they think they're still a good Christian. Of course, to, according to their own standards, they're really good. But going about to establish their own righteousness, they've not submitted to His. They've stopped growing. They've been withered, and they don't realize they've been cut off from growth. What about when the sun gets hot? Growing... All they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <clears throat> so, you, you sprout and you go away and the sun starts getting hot so you back off. What about when persecution arises because of the word? Are you going to be stumbled? What about when I have to stop being me and have to be conformed to God's will? What rocks are lurking beneath the soft surface which keeps the roots from getting down deep? And it be, could be the rock of Marcionism, the rock of our forefathers, our heritage, the rock of my Calvinistic theology, the rock of my Bible college education, the rock of false grace, the rock of once saved, always saved, the rock of presumption, a false sense of exemption, resting in a creed or resting in a group, resting in a certain look. Resting in the fact that I don't have electricity and I ride a horse and buggy. Resting in the fact that our church gives a lot to missions. Resting in some other fact other than you having a living, obeying faith and following the words of God. Growing. Seeking. Walking with God. There's rocks there. And even though there's been a sprout, sooner or this isn't going to last long at this stage. If you don't move on from this stage, you will wither, you will dry up, and you will go no farther. You will grow no further. Well, the next step. Well, there's a seed, and they fell among thorns. They've heard, they go forth. Okay, so this is the stage of the novice. And the question here is,
Will the word be choked? You know, the first stage, I'd say, in that stage, they're going to last from two to five years before God says, no, what for cumbers at the ground? These people go out, and they're, they're actually uh, doing much better. They might, they might be in a growth state from five to maybe 20 years. Growing. Going somewhere. Learning. Being conformed. But even then, these are the ones who allow other seeds to grow as well. They allow competing plants to grow as well. They do not recognize them and label them as enemy. Okay? They still have a friend with maybe a question mark, but they haven't labeled enemies as enemies. And so they let them grow. They're still enamored by the world, curious, investigating, unwary, the presumptuous, the incautious. The question is, will the fruit come to maturity? They may be still tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They haven't solidified in a direction. The world is not so bad. You might hear them say, I try to see both sides. I feel like I'm uh, an arbitrator between God and the world. I, I, I am not as radical as those. You know, I, I want to be friends with both sides. I kind of want to see both sides and, and, and both sides like me. Things, they, they go out and they allow things in their life, other values, other opinions, ideas, viewpoints to be sowed in the ground. They lack separation. They lack caution. They lack the fear of God. You know, I hear them say, well, what's wrong with it? They're not focused on being a disciple like an athlete focuses on winning the Olympics. Mm -hmm. There's things like, in, out in the world, Facebook, internet, smartphones, TV, news, friends, family, society, your heritage, your denomination, your pet doctrines, man's acceptance, man's applause, money, clothes, cars, trucks, lands, houses, adventure, vacations, dreams, ambitions, marriage, children, relatives, work, play. Well, not all those are bad. Not all those are enemies. But how much space do they get? That's right. How much time do they get? It says here, they go forth and are choked with cares. Are cares bad? Cares aren't bad. How much time do they get? How much value? How much priority? And riches. Riches in and of themselves are not bad. And pleasures of this life. Pleasures are not bad. There's going to be eternal pleasures in heaven, right? So how much time and appropriate energy is given to the pursuit of these cares, riches, and pleasures? And they bring no fruit to perfection. There's an imbalance like we talked about last week. They bring no fruit to perfection because of the cares and the pleasures and the pursuit of riches. Matthew puts it this way. Back in Matthew 13. <clears throat> okay, Matthew 13. Uh, <clears throat> but he that receiveth the seed. He also receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world or the care of this life. This life and the cares thereof. Okay? And the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. He bringeth no fruit to perfection. If your apple tree only had green apples and they never ripened, would it be a fruitful tree or not? If your peach tree dropped the peaches before they became soft and pink, it would not be a fruitful tree. So they bring no fruit to perfection. They never become what God wants them to become. They never pass on anything, uh, a testimony worth passing on. They don't bring any fruit to perfection. Now you might be in these stages. But if you stay in those stages, you will eventually wither. You will be cut down. You will be choked. You will not make it on Judgment Day. We were all lost at one time. We were all babies at one time. We were all novice at one time. But the one who continues to grow is seen 
in the one who is actually saved. It says here, but they, but that on the good ground. Now remember, the ground is what? It's you. Okay? It's you. Whether it's tilled or not has to do with your character. It has to do with the willing heart. It has to do with you putting off the old man, putting on the new man. That old man is those stony places. The old man is that hard pan. The old man is what allows the weeds to grow. The old man is what is not careful to root up the weeds and keep the weeds out and label them as enemy and not friend. See, there's a lot of things that we call a friend, but it eventually chokes us. Okay, because we're not wise. We don't fear God enough. We have too much confidence in our ability. So we allow things to come in, take too much time, and the word is choked, and no fruit is brought to perfection. They on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart. Now, honesty. Question mark. Honesty. Question mark. Honesty. Question mark. The reason there's a question mark is because honesty is what will cause you to go forward. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be honest? Are you going to be honest? Now, over here, honesty is no longer with a question mark. Because you don't get here without having an honest and good heart. It says right there. That's right. In an honest and good heart. It requires honesty to get to this spot. In this area, they have a single eye. It says here, having heard the word, keep it. They don't compromise it. They don't alter it. They don't get stumbled by it. They don't reject it. They keep it. They love it. They embrace it. And bring forth fruit with patience. So, if the, the last one, we say the face is set. In Isaiah 50, verse 7, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. In other words, I have this deep abiding conviction that I'm going to do what is right. It's the best thing to do. It's the smartest way to live. I, when I get to the end of the road, I'm not going to be ashamed that I did it. Amen. And therefore, I have set my face like a flint. I'm going that way. That's maturity yes. in the Christian life. The Bible says in Luke 9, 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. If you look at that phrase in the Old Testament, God says many times, Those who, who dabble in idolatry, this or that, I will set my face against that man, and against that family, and against that nation. It has to do with a determined purpose. My mind is made up. My course is set. I'm going that way. I'm going to label the enemies as enemies. I'm going to mark them as such. The stones are going to be removed. There's no, there's no toleration of stones. No toleration of distractions. The distractions are rooted out. I'm no longer impressed or curious about the world's parade. Competing values are crucified. I'm grounded in the word. Life's sparkling cup is left behind. My affections are set on things above. I'm content to watch the world go by. I'm laying up treasure in heaven. Godliness with contentment. In other words, I am content to be godly. I'm content to be godly. I'm going to find my joy there. I'm going to find my purpose there. I'm going to be fulfilled there. I'm going to be godly. I'm going to be godly. I'm going to do what's godly. I'm going to forward a godly cause. And I'm going to be happy in that. Ecclesiastes 8.12 Solomon finally figured it out. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. We're talking about firm conviction. We're talking about 
No longer wavering back and forth about whether I'm going to surrender, whether I'm going to obey. It's not a question. The question marks are gone. My course is set. My decision's made. My testimony is going to be maintained. Maintaining my testimony is my joy and purpose in life. Yeah. Building a testimony, maintaining a testimony, passing on a testimony, being an example. It, it's, it, my face is set. This is maturity. This story is what is happening on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. The one who is mature, the Apostle Paul describes this way. <clears throat> but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness or justification which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the justification which is of God by faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either already perfect, but I follow after, I pursue, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now listen to what he says. Let us therefore as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. And if any, in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If you do not have this mature mind, God is working to reveal it to you. But this is maturity. This is maturity. This is a maturity that when you get to the end of your life, you can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, this is the simple, understandable story that God Almighty gave to us. This is what He sees happening on planet Earth. This is what in the world is going on. You can get caught up in all the other stuff, but this is what's going on. When it's all said and done, this is what's been going on. The seed is being sown. Will the seed take root? Will there be honesty with the seed? Will the roots go deep soon enough before the sun gets hot, before persecution comes, before it's challenged too greatly? Will it take root? Will it go? Or will it become satisfied? Will the word be choked? There's a lot of baggage, a lot of old man that's got to be put off, a lot of new man that's got to be put on. Will the word be choked? And then there's maturity. The face is set. The weeds are gone. The stones are gone. The enemies are identified as enemies. The purpose is established. The Word of God is studied. There's honesty with the Word. There's not, there's not the working for the ism. Truth is all that matters. If my ism is wrong, I change. I, I, I study the Word. If the Word... I was a Baptist. The Word did not line up with the Baptist. I left the Baptist. I checked out the Mennonites. The Word did not line up with the Mennonites. I left the Mennonites. But I didn't leave them in a sense of deserting everything they said, neither with the Baptist. I took what was true and left what was false. And this was allowed to bear fruit. It was not choked because I had a name that I was attached to. It was not choked because of an ideology that I really felt, you know, embraced and really liked, like my, my pacifist ideas. Or my ideas about marriage and divorce, regardless of what God said about it. 
or my ideas about the government, regardless of what the Bible says about it. The word can be choked by all kinds of things. It can be choked by wanting to be what we call worldly. It can be choked by a false piety. It can be choked by adhering to false doctrine, false concepts. Will the word be choked? When you reach maturity, the word is all that matters. Study. Not, not okay, God. Oh, I got a verse. No. No, that's not maturity. That's way back here somewhere. Okay? Maturity is when you want to know what the writer was saying. Who is he talking to? What does this phraseology mean? What did it mean in that day? What's the original intent? How does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. Proper context. Yeah. Proper application of the word. Not just, well, I like, I like this book, but well, I, I don't really like this back here. No, you're a fool. The word is choked by your own foolishness. Your lack of honesty. The lack of honesty that you think you know more about God's will and the apostles because you read their book. You think you're smarter than the apostles. You think you're smarter than Moses who talked with God face to face. Oh, you got it all figured out, but they, did, they didn't understand. Jesus met with the apostles for 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. He met with them and discussed the kingdom. And you think you understand the kingdom better than they. That's what the problem is. Lack of honesty. The word's choked. The roots aren't deep. There's got to come a day. There's got to come a day when you set your face. Regardless of family, regardless of friend, regardless of the applause of men, regardless of your image, regardless of the hardness of the way, regardless of what you've got to let go of, regardless of what you've labeled friend, which is really an enemy, regardless of all that, you set your face to be not almost a Bible Christian, but altogether a Bible Christian. Amen. Not almost a disciple, but altogether a disciple. Yes. You set your face to be a disciple the way an athlete sets his face on winning the gold medal at the Olympics. You know what Paul said? Mm -hmm. So fight I, so run that you may obtain. That's maturity. And that is honesty. Everywhere over here, there's a big question mark over whether you're going to be honest with God. Are you going to be honest with God? Are you running from God? Are you hiding in the dark away from the light? Because your deeds are evil and they'll be reproved if they come to the light. Honesty is a big question mark. Oh, you say, but I received Jesus. Will the roots go deep quick enough? <clears throat> oh, but I, I'm, I'm bringing forth some fruit. Will it come to perfection? Are those apples going to stay green forever? Or is it going to be the precious fruit of the earth brought to perfection? So, this is what's going on on planet earth. This is the most important thing that's going on on planet earth. This is what God sees as what in the world is happening. Let's stand together. What a simple story. God Almighty, the one who flung planets into space in perfect precision, who set the ordinances of, heaven, of the heavens, who made the microscopic atoms, everything in a perfect balance, so there could be life on earth. And yet, he tells us what's really going on. The big picture, the picture, in such a simple story. You know, when, when somebody can take an incredibly complex subject and make it simple, it's a sign of a great intelligence. Mm -hmm. If I take something that's simple and I make it complicated, it shows a lack of intelligence. Mm -hmm. But if I take something that's incredibly complex and I can bring it down and just put it in a nutshell that really says it all in just a few words, that's a sign of great understanding. And that's what Jesus did over 
and over and over. Mm -hmm. The question is, he brought it down to simplicity. Am I still too simple to see it? Or am I just too stubborn? Am I honest? Am I willing to look in the mirror and be honest with myself? Am I willing to be honest with God? Any thoughts before we go to prayer? Right, you said he made it simple, so are we willing to see it? <coughs> it makes me think about different denominations that, that uh, even the Catholic Church, where they they make it so complicated. They they try to act like it's so complicated that only uh, the priest or only certain people that the word the Bible would just confuse you. Right. No, the right. Lord made it very understandable to human. Uh, to mankind if they're willing to study it and open their mind to it and for you to muddy the water just because you want all the interpretation to be coming through you and I, when, when Jesus spoke this the number one industry was agriculture every farmer right. understands this yeah. I dare say there will be no excuse for ignorance for anybody who hears this message that's it's very understandable, very, very easy to understand. And so, if you've heard the message and you're of any age to understand anything, uh, you're very accountable. You know, there is no shame <clears throat> in being here. There's shame in staying here. Right. That's right. There's no shame in being here, but there's shame in staying here. There's no shame in being here, but there's shame in staying here. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. I'm sure that I heard a lot of good sermons growing up. It's amazing the difference it made when I was born again. When I repented, I began to hear the sermons. I began to hear the songs. I began to see things I didn't see before. <laughs> but, I had a choice in my ears opening up. I didn't get a zap from heaven. I decided yeah. honest. I decided to get honest with myself. To face the truth honestly. That is an essential step in being born again face the truth of God honestly. Alright, let's stand together so we have a selection.